Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. I like this one. Who is it? Who is this? It's uh, No Flocking. Oh, I love it. He knows that I love this kind of music. Oh, I like that. We should have kept it up longer. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. At the end. Let's play him at yeah, the end. How's that? Uh, I can okay. do that. Thank you very much. And I need my applause, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, there we go. <laughs> we have an enormous studio audience in here today for our show, What's Up with Cobalt and Friends. This is going to be a fun show. We have two <laughs> really cool people in studio. They are actors, among other things. They are in the latest play called, what is it called? The Icebergs. It's not the, right? It's just Icebergs. It's just Icebergs. icebergs. No, the. It's called Icebergs. So, applause for our guests here. <laughs> we have Rebecca Henderson. Very easy to say. Thank you. And then we've got Luke Near... Oh my gosh! I'm oh, terrible. You, you got so nervous that you messed up even the first part. I did. <laughs> Here, Lucas. I'll say, I'll say Lucas. it first. I'll say I it first, that. and then you say it. Okay. Lucas. Lucas. Near. Near. Verbrugge. Near Verbrugge. Did Perfect. I do that right? Yeah, you did it. Lucas so near right. Verbrugge. I'm gonna say that. Can I say that ten times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucas near Verbrugge. Lucas near Verbrugge. Thank you for joining us so much. <laughs> Thank you for I having really me. appreciate it. This was a terrific play. I saw it last week. It was wonderful, and we also have uh, the writer who may or may not be calling in. She's been really busy, but she's nice enough to possibly, you know, give us a little bit of her time. Um, Elena Smith, so she's really incredible. She's mm -hmm. also written The Affair, The Newsroom, all kinds of uh, work that she's done, and I'm a really big fan of, uh, which is why I went to go see the play. Um, tell us briefly about uh, your character. You are the neighbor, right? You play... The best friend. The best friend, yeah. the neighbor, the lesbian couple who's so you know you're you're in, involved in a relationship a, um, a lesbian relationship but you're in conflict correct yeah yep. and you are sort of the high-powered agent i loved your suit i know it's very <laughs> metrosexual <you>. very cool <laughs> very handsome i will tell you thank you very so, much so um but this is a great story about on many 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 levels about what's going on with i hate the word millennials i can't stand it but whatever older millennials right yeah. like we're not even millennials we're too old for that right i think so right i, I mean so. i don't get it like millennials are well are somewhere between like 18 <laughs> and 38 i mean how do you have such a wide i spectrum? think we're right actually right on the cusp i i yeah. look this up like once a month to make sure i'm still not a millennial it just yeah. won't i'm end. always disappointed because i think i'm just i i, I actually think 35 am. and up is no, not a millennial so what's 35 yeah. and up that's like a what are, what we? are we i don't know we or regeneration x we i don't grew like up playing all nintendo these, i don't like yeah. th there you go we grew Game up playing Boy. nintendo i don't like all these labels though they're irritating well, because do, everybody goes through the same shit all the time right it's except, like except yeah. except that if you if you went through high school with full access to the world wide web i do think that your interaction with the, the world wide web <laughs> got it got it what? it's a global thing i did not go through high we school with the world wide web so what does that make me like ancient or something so well, what, what not generation are you i don't know the generations i actually like don't x, know there's why there's i think I think the millennials are people who came up with cell phones and email addresses from like the time of birth. Pretty so much. this play yep. sort of kind of takes place with the like, older millennials, right? About um, sure. issues. Um, you know, you've got a writer in New York. He's married to a um, his wife is in flux. She's very interested in the environment and she's an aspiring she's terrified actress. of she's an climate aspiring, change. Actually, terrified of climate change. Yeah. Her rant I found to be hysterical because I happen to know people who are like that. Yeah, yeah. Me too. And they can barely walk out of the house because they're afraid of... No, I get it. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. But um, so, you know, it touches upon that. It touches upon um, having a kid. Should you have one? Should you not? Um, you know, the agent. I liked your character quite a bit. As a person? Um, you or? played him well. Is Thanks. what it was. I, <laughs> I could tell he was kind of a slimy guy, but not really inside. He was really a nice He's guy. Got a good heart. A mm -hmm. really good heart. Yeah. And you played it well. Thanks. And you were the friend, the conflicted friend. So let me start with you. Okay. What attracted you to this role in the first place? Um, well, she's really in my wheelhouse. I am a lot like Molly. We have a ton of similarities. I know. We talked last night, and you told me a little bit about yourself. I'm like, wait a minute. You are like Molly. basically this person, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it does, no wonder. I was so. saying last night during the talk back, somebody was asking me a similar question. And, you know, I got the audition, and they wanted the tape back right away. I was in, I'm from New York, live right. in New York. 
and the playbook. You're picks. a brunette from New York. That's in right. Fact. And I'm, now I'm a blonde in LA. And you're, you're a blonde. <laughs> look at this town's done here. I'm telling you. I love same it here. thing. I came to LA <laughs> and leaving. I started streaking my hair. It's like, it's, I don't know what that is. But yeah. anyway, go ahead. Um, and so I got the audition and I taped, I like read the script quickly and I got the sides and I learned them. I learned them right away. I basically read them like once or twice and then taped it and knew all the lines and. How do I, you do that? Well, I don't know. You can't always do that. That's the thing. But like there was something about this part that I just it's like all your instincts, all my instincts were firing for this person. It was a super playful audition. I taped it once I sent it. I got the part a couple hours later. So God. Yeah. I mean, I'm also like a, I just turned 36. So I'm like the same age as Molly. I just got married to a woman. We want to have a child. We're terrified to have a child right now, especially with Trump just being elected. Um, I'm from Canada originally. My wife is like, let's go to Canada. I was like, I don't want to go to Canada. Don't ever Canada. let a, any politician <laughs> scare you into I having know. or not having a kid. Come on. He's not going to do anything. Oh, I know. It's Pence you got to worry about. So we got to well, keep, here's that, the deal. We got to keep Trump about. alive. That's what we have to I know, do. I know. Who, who would think? But that's, a, that's what we have to hope for. Yeah. So go ahead. But that, yeah, I mean, that's that's basically that's basically it. And I wanted to come to, I wanted to work in L.A. And my wife had gotten a job here at the same time, so it was it was perfect. And I'm having a really good time. We'll we'll touch upon her in a few moments because yeah. I know she's quite accomplished on her own as well. Yeah. How about you, Lucas? Uh, what attracted me to the part? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you really you just hit it right. I know so many characters, j- agents, yeah. just like this guy. Yeah. Um. Um. You know, I I played a. a Different but kind of similar vein character for another project I'd worked on with Elena. And um, I, I like was so appreciative that she saw me as someone who could be a real douchebag um, because I, I, I just thought because you're, you're not so a real fun. douchebag. Well, no, because I just don't get to be in real life that's what i mean like to like let that <laughs> so in out. real life you just sort of walk around with a halo on your head yeah. you're just such a really i'm just such a like genuinely guy. just like nice guy all the time that it was just therapeutic stretch. to pretend what it would be like to be a real <laughs> asshole um but he really wasn't an asshole but he's not an asshole actually well i know most agents can be but somehow i felt like he had a heart well i i kind of feel like with assholes in general um, with assholes in general, the people, not the sphincter. That uh, <laughs> that I, I'm, you know, I, like I, you kind, you kind of, you can write someone off for being an asshole, or you can try to figure out, like, well, why, like, what's behind it? Because I right. always feel like there's something behind it, and I kind of, I guess, I kind of err on the side of feeling like humans are essentially like good, good until they become an asshole, or we make them into an asshole, or yeah, right? yeah, or you know, there's something. It's like it's usually for for like for me, I, I I feel like people who are like that, it usually comes out of a deep insecurity, and that and it's not that they're a bad person necessarily, but just that I mean, listen, bad people exist, but. Uh, but uh, to me, it's more interesting if someone actually is trying to make the right decisions, but their but, view of the world is such that it it's hard for them to get past their own whatever narcissism or. But he's not even an asshole. He's he's cheesy. I think he's, he's cheesy. cheesy. Well, he's cheesy. OK, look, I, I'm sorry. I'll take the floor. here. Okay. So, you know, Whose show is this? I'm, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm also from New York. So, yeah. Yeah. um you know, and New Yorkers do it a little differently. We say it a little more like it is. And out yeah. here, especially the agents, I have to say, yeah. and you know that, they sort of want to keep it all positive. Yes. Like, oh, my God, guess who we got? But not really. It was just a phone call about it. And they're like, oh, guess who we got? And guess what's going? And they're always trying to keep it in the mix. Don't you find that? Yeah. Well, there's always a sense of momentum. And we're always talking about something that isn't quite tangible. It's like traction. Like, what is traction? So oh, it's he has not traction. quite he bullshit, tra- right? But it's they're just trying to keep it moving. Yeah. I've yeah. New York's that. not like that. No. I it's like, like that it's better like, than... Yeah. It's yeah. like, guess what? It ain't going to happen. Yeah. Keep moving. It's like, oh, yeah. so you might be a little startled, but don't you find that? And I feel like you yeah. played yeah. the perfect agent for L.A. Well, and so I think good. that you also those that in that in that world out here, too, that you there's a sense that if you kind of start talking about it and you can spin it, it will happen because people suddenly think that they it's like the FOMO thing. It's like fear of missing out. And if I talk about a client as like, listen, I mean, you can come with us or not, but this guy's going to blow up. Right. Then, and then you're thinking, then you go like, well, oh, if he I does blow up, it. I don't want to be the person who passed on him. And so then, you know, so it's more psychological. You're creating yeah. something out of nothing. It's, it's all like, spin. It's like sp- social media. How many of us are looking on social media and everybody's having like the time of their lives at a party? Meanwhile, they're miserable. You know, yeah. it's sort of the same yeah. thing. Yeah. It's just sort of the whole spin that you create around it. But you got him 
dead on. Yeah. Um, but the suit is what got me from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. it's, you uh, had it's me at 90%, the suit. 90% that suit. You had me at the suit. <laughs> it's not even a very nice suit, no, I, I have to say. No, it's just that no, it's not an expensive look, suit. No, not, really that, not yeah. that either. It's just, it was a very, you know, stylist, I call it the metrosexual look, you know, very yeah. tailored, sort yeah. of a little shorter, yeah. where you can yeah. see the shoe yeah. and yeah. tailored, but not Sl- quite right. Color slim coordinated. Short. It's throughout. a slim, slim short. Is that what they call yeah. those? Boring. Yeah, yeah, and I know so many guys who it's go really to work like that fashion, and show up at meetings like that. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So and the playwright is from. She's from from New York, right? Or is she from here? She's from upstate New York. Yeah. So she's Elena. she she's a fast thinker, fast talker. Yeah. You know that's another oh, thing I hope that she attracted calls me in, to. Yeah. Because I love my New Yorkers. It's yeah. Like we yeah. just start rattling on, and by the end of the show, nobody can understand us because we just can't you know stop. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And she's um, also lived here for a while, so she gets the LA thing and the New York thing. Right. The Molly Molly's like a fast talking, fast thinking person. Uh, they're all actually. And the agent thing, uh, that's something that, I mean, she she actually had her agent come to uh, (laughs) one of the early readings of this play, and it was really interesting to watch him react to the whole thing, too. Well, I mean, let's, a very sweet guy. I mean, on opening night, the ag- we, the agents were scream laughing. I mean, really? everybody right. was. It, we couldn't even get through the show. Well, first of all, it's just so LA and it's so a very LA inside play. baseball. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of things. It's it's LA. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, that the term inside baseball. Inside it's baseball. Term, yeah. is, it, is that the term? <laughs> I think so. I don't know, but I, I think know. you're That's right. A segment I on mean ESPN. it as a compliment. Yeah, right. no, I agree. This play is not about baseball, though. But everything about it no, it's me. not about baseball. <laughs> <laughs> she should have put that in there too. You know, we're a baseball town, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Definitely not a football town. No, but I really liked also the head character, and he's not here uh, today. Nate. But he Nate was Cordray. terrific. Yeah, we'll I, speak for him. I, yeah, let's speak for him. Do you like yeah. the guy? I mean, no, we could, absolutely you know, not. We could either put the guy down completely here and, and or not. So very he's difficult amazing. person. He looked it. He looked like a real pain in the ass. Yeah, right? he's a pain in so, the ass. Yeah. No, but I could he's see the sweetest, the easiest, the no, funniest. Yeah, well, no, yeah. we're just joking. Super talented. Yeah. You can tell that this is Unbearable a cast. To be around of, <laughs> you could see it was a cast of people who really, really connected and got. I mean, I can feel that as an audience member. Yeah. Maybe just because I'm so connected to theater and I love it so much. Yeah. Um, I could tell that you were, you, I mean, you really were the characters, each and every one of you. You in particular, because they wrote it for you, I guess, Molly, right? It seems like it. <laughs> she didn't, but <laughs> we, we met We met on this project. But somebody suggested me for this part, a good friend of hers who's also a friend of mine. And yeah, it seems like it was a good I mean, But a especially good nowadays with what's going on politically, people are concerned. They're worried about it. I try and tell them, please just take a breath and let's see what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um you know, try and get behind it. I'm not a Trump supporter, so let me just be clear. But I'm just trying because I had yeah, a friend in last night, and I'm actually working on a book, and she's an editor, and she came in to work on it with me. Oh, my gosh. And she's so afraid of the world and what's going to happen. I said, just just, just, just let's wait. Mm-hmm. Let's, you know, no, no one guy can really destroy us so badly. But the playwright touched on so many things, you know, what's going on politically, what's going on environmentally, what's going on socially with mm-hmm. gay issues. I think it's very important. It happens to be one that's close to my heart in particular. Um, the work environment in L.A., you're right. It's different than, than it is out in New York and other places. And just um, the interaction between everybody and what people are hiding, mm-hmm. um, that's another thing. Um, so go ahead. Well, no, I, I mean, I, I think... What I really love about this play is that it it does take place against the backdrop of real environmental issues concerns. that are huge. And the main character, you know, you were saying that you loved her her monologue and there's like a humor in that because she's kind of spinning out about all this stuff that is overwhelming, but none of that's made up. I mean, it's all it it's all it's all based on like you can go and read articles. There's about no doubt about it. And you know what's funny? You said spin out. Yeah. And a lot of people will spin out about it, and then yeah. they'll just stop listening. But she, it's such an important point, and we yeah. have to listen. And yeah. to me, one of the one of the big questions that uh, that this play provokes for me when I read it initially was like, well, what do we do? Like you have this information, and it is very easy to read it and become overwhelmed and say, well. If this is all true, then like, what are we doing? Like, how do we just go forward and live like a normal life and have a kid and try to have like a regular relationship when it seems like the world is ending? And I, I think that like in a time of panic, a lot of us are kind of asking that question of like, well, what do what do we do? And like, how do we get involved? And how do we feel like we are part of the solution, not part of the problem? And and where do we get information? And I where think. do we get our information? And what do you do with that information? Well, and I think that's really important because it you can't, if you're just getting news and then letting it kind of give you meltdowns over and over again, 
I think there has to be some kind of output and there has to be a sense of like the greater community too. That is such a huge point, what you just made. First of all, where do you get your news? That's a big one because yeah. my friends who are like, uh, let's just talk politics for a minute, mm -hmm. who are super liberal, I'm like, don't watch the liberal stations. Go over and watch Fox. See what the other side's saying. Yeah. You know, you've got to get your information from everywhere. And those yeah. who are more conservative, I'm like, listen to the other guys. Instead yeah. of just, you know, listening to what you believe to your bubble. in. Yeah. You know, what's that going to do? That's not going to change anything because then it's just going to be one side against the other. Yeah. Um, but a it lot was of kind of shocking, though, during the run up to the election. Nobody was talking about climate change. No, like nobody. Was well, even first of all, I don't know if they I don't know. They but even Hillary's side. She once or twice, but not a lot. I don't know why. And I'll tell you what, because for Trump, for example, they feel very differently about climate change than the current administration. That can be an issue. Yeah. But Although now he's saying like, well, maybe it is from man. Uh, well, he's someone he's who tends to like, well, he tends to beat his chest just to get to where he has to go. And yeah, then he goes, course. well, maybe there won't be a wall. Yeah. Well, maybe there won't. And I think that's how he goes into a negotiation, like a big bully so that you're, you're kind of bracing for yourself and go, OK, OK, I'll give in. And then he goes, all right. One so of I think it's in his thing. actions, though, because you got to look at the who was the guy they who they put in there they to be the head an, of the like an ant like a anti he's a climate denier climate yeah, I know the one yeah. who was with um oh my god why am I why am I uh, drawing a blank with uh, the bright he was with Breitbart, Breitbart yeah. I know who you're talking about oh him too yeah. him too but no the guy that they're putting this is I'm, okay. I'm sounding like an idiot I don't know anything I don't else. either but anyway, somebody call in would rough. you please someone answer this question um, I should call my husband because he knows this stuff off the top of his head one but, of the um, things that's so crazy about climate change that I was thinking about recently is like it, I feel like we just keep hearing like there's nothing we can do like there's the you know, everybody signed the, tr the treaty, the Paris, mm -hmm. what's it called? Paris Accord. The, I can't remember. We actually say the line in the plan. I can't remember because we're not on stage at the point. But um, everybody signed, you know, 200 countries signed this. But I feel like there's this idea that we can't do it. Like we can't stop it. There's nothing that can really help unless it's happening at like a huge level. And I wish there was more of a feeling like we like more action happening just among people, even with to do with recycling or like buying a Prius or like, do you know what I mean? It's just feeling like the, the water's it's, coming and there's nothing we can do. The pollution's everywhere and there's nothing we can do. You know what it is? It's complicated. That's what, That's what it is. A lot of people think it, that it's man-made and it's not necessarily at all. Because if you just look at evolution in general, look at how different, you know, climate change is what it is. It, it changes. And it changes over such an incredible amount of time. Although within what I think the past fifty years or a hundred years, yeah, the, the science is saying that the we scientists are having have this said impact. that we are having in yeah. fact an impact, and we do have to look at that. And it's certainly not just us; it's all the other countries out there that sure. they're spewing out this pollutants the way they make stuff. There's no regulations at all, and they're actually very, very often responsible for spitting this stuff up in the air, up mm -hmm. into the atmosphere. It is complicated, but that's why a play like this to so just touch upon it is is important because then people start talking about it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so back to your lives. Let's talk a little bit about your personal life. So you live between L.A. and New York, right? Yeah. I'm, our home base is in New York, but we're here several months out of the year. And your wife, what does she do? My wife is, uh, her name's Leslie Headland. She's a filmmaker, director, playwright. Mm -hmm. um, she's probably most well known for a play she wrote called Bachelorette, which she then wrote the screenplay for and directed. Um, starring Kirsten Dunst, which is funny because Kirsten Dunst. That's hysterical. Is in the play. I mean, she's in not in play. the play, but she's talked about it quite a bit that's in the right. play. Well, that's actually sort <laughs> of a hilarious. funny coincidence. Yeah. yeah. Six degrees of Kirsten Dunst. <laughs> a lot okay. of a lot of coincidences. So, <laughs> do you see like a lot of differences because there are, you know, um, between living here and between living in New York? Do you do you have a preference? Um, you know, it's funny. Every time I come here, I'm like, oh, my God, L.A., I get it. The weather is amazing. I like driving a car, putting the groceries in the car. It's like such an easier way of life. But when at a certain point, I always start to feel like I can't hike another dust bowl. Get me out of here. The positivity is killing me. <laughs> like, Do you know? <laughs> oh, like, it's OK. It's like really good. It's like, no, it really isn't good. Yeah, it's exactly. like I'm pissed off today. OK. Yeah. And if you're in New York and you're walking down the street and. You know, you can sort of feel that yeah. and get it out of your system. And it can be isol a little isolating here. Yes. You know. But in New York. Yes, you know, it's because York of the car. I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah. Yeah. You don't walk with everybody in New York. You're walking with the Get rich, on the train the poor, with them. Exactly. You know, you're mingling with everybody. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And my neighborhood in New York, a lot of my friends live there. And I think, yeah, whenever I get back to New York, I'm like, oh, thank God, we're never leaving. When the, but it's good to go back and forth. I mean, the whole this whole idea of bi-coastal is really I entertain awesome. more here, though, in my house, whereas in New York, you know, it's more at a restaurant yeah. or, you know, I guess in the apartment. So, but I, I, I don't know. I like both. I'm one of those people yeah. who can go both ways. the theater ways. culture in New York is amazing because afterwards you don't, you don't have to drive. So you can go to the bar, you can have drinks. Everyone gets on the subway or cabs home and... 
It's really nice. Love. Yeah. Love, love. But out here, I think I was saying to one of you guys last night, the theater is really changing out here. We've got like the Broad and we've got some, yeah. you know, some cool stuff that's coming up and some really great plays that yeah. ordinarily would not have had a home here, you know. Um, anyway, so you, where are you from and what do you like What's to do in your time off? Yeah, what do you do? You're a single guy? I'm a single guy. Let's um, talk about that a little single, bit. Single, ready to mingle. I yes. am mingling and trying to keep my head on my shoulders Who are you at the mingling same with? time. Who are you mingling with, Lucas? You want first names, last names? <laughs> I just, yeah, if you want to provide that. Sure, Tinder, go ahead. Tinder profiles? Um, I had a Tinder meltdown uh, earlier, uh, a couple months ago. While we were doing this play. What does that mean? That means you had an overwhelming amount of women who wanted to meet you? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, no. <laughs> cute. Um, He's a cute guy. I can see it. So I wonder if people are swiping by you or just checking you. So what do you think? Well, I don't, I, I, I you know, it's very overwhelming, Tinder, because there's, you, you, uh, to me, it became, I became like addicted to getting likes. And I, I was actually, I was like too busy. I was like, I can't actually meet with anybody. Like, I don't have time to go on dates. Like. But I, I, I would like go home and like spend like an hour just like swiping. I just like I like sit I like stand in the middle of my living room. Just so like, you were swiping past all the, the women that wanted to. Well, meet you swipe. You, you swipe. You swipe. For, you swipe for yes and for no. For yes and for no. So if right. you if you're not interested in someone, you swipe one way. If you are interested in them, you swipe the other way. So did you get a lot and of interest? And then if if two people swipe each other you're a match then it goes bing and then you get this little like shot of adrenaline you're like somebody likes me okay, but it's not and then fair. you have to text for a million years it's not fair because all the ugly people are getting swiped away right i mean come on that's I did not necessarily with... true you got to get your tinder dame go tinder dame <laughs> tinder game tinder going. game see i've never been on and it so then i'm it becomes married a whole, well then it becomes a whole thing about how do you curate your tinder profile what do you say you have like whatever 250 words or 400 words to describe yourself okay wait but how a lot often, happens how often do people look better or worse when you finally see them in person I mean, who's gonna go with an awful picture where know. you look fat and kind of like dumpy sure. and sure so people boring and worse. no job unemployed well, some people play this like reverse psychology game where they'll they're like don't get too excited they'll like just put me. a picture of just like this is like me i just like woke up and i'm in my pjs I and mean, you can tell if it's been curated yeah. or if if it's like actually this is probably what you look like in the morning yeah. and i found myself actually more attracted to the photos that look like real people than the ones where it was like well who wouldn't you show up and you know they I know, just but there's so few and far between like most i feel like most of the people's profiles were like super duck face and like there's a there's like a there's like a a button where you can like there's like a beauty filter. I do not know how to do that. That makes your face look you like can do it. it's you've had a makeover. There you go. You nailed it. Yeah, that's your duck face right there. I know duck faces are awful. What is They're it with so this town? Or like their, mirror face. What is it with this town and their beaks? I don't understand women, I or I guess men. I don't know, but mostly women who My are doing the whole duck thing. Do it. Why? I no, guys do it too, it. though. Okay. Guys do it too. It's like that blue steel thing where they'd be like, Oh God, what's that? What do you do to get that? You oh, like I furrow have a your brow who does all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is the New Yorker in me. I'm yeah. like, really? I mean, you, we all. Yeah, look my as, New Yorker friend does it all the time, though. But we want to look as you know as good as we can. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just maybe because I don't have time. I have three kids, so I'm just busy. Yeah, you're busy. I have a husband that you know. Some days I want him, and or some days I have don't. Priorities. So, so that you know, I told him I was t talking to him last night about the Tinder. I'm like, it's just not fair because what? I got somebody on the phone. Okay, tell him to wait. So you know, but people do meet people online. My mother met her husband on yeah, like old school Tinder in Canada. I don't even know what it's called. Old school Tinder in Canada. Yeah, like, like for old people. Like, is there Tinder? No, but like some, like the first dating site in Canada, I think, is where she met him. Because they've called, been together like a. thirteen years now, or something. Hey. Yeah. Hey, okay, what's but, up? But hey, wait a hey, minute. Guys. I want to know. So you were on Tinder. You're swiping away, and then you got I sick of it. I, I was swiping away. No, I like mm. went on a couple dates, and it was fine and fun and whatever. But like, uh, but but then I was like, I'm spending too much time on this app. I was like, I have, there's so okay, many, you got obsessed. there's so many things I could be doing instead of just swiping you past could be reading, this foolishness. You could be like, you know, could be finding, reading. you could be like actually talking to women face to face. I could be actually like, like, yeah, face to face with an actual human being, you know, instead of texting. But are you back on it now? No, I'm not. Oh, but so what you. I did, I got off, I was like, I'm getting off. And I, I, I had, there were, there were like five people that I hadn't communicated with. And I sent them all this like Hail Mary text being like, I'm deleting the app. I was like, if you want to contact but me, but you're kind of cute. So here's my number, yeah. and I will only be accepting calls. I like no took text. it old school. No text. I was like, you? I Did just want you? you to call me if you're interested. Did you get a call? I got a call. One, five. How many? You said One. you did. Oh, and did it's you meet good. her? But by the way, who's on the phone? Is it our writer or is it? Or is, is it my Tinder date? Is it or a Tinder date? She's like, how dare you talk about me, Kurt? <laughs> 
Who's on the phone? Are you sure it's not it's seven? Dan. Oh, Dan. Dan. Hang on. Oh, do you love that voice? Yeah. yeah he that? is. He's a very good friend of mine. He's oh. also a broadcaster. Dan, can we go to you in a minute? Because I still have my guests in here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is Ooh, he not hysterical? Dan. I'll set him. I know, right? What a voice. Oof. Oh, he's happily married, though, too, so I can't go there. Nice. And he's been one of my best friends since I was, like, practically like a teenager. So, <laughs> anyway, if you want to chime in, go ahead, Dan. We're talking about no, no, no. we're no, talking no, about Lucas on Tinder, for God's sakes. And you're married. The important you're in, stuff. Yeah, the important stuff, for goodness sakes. I so, haven't dated for, you know, A hundred years, 80s, right? So. Yeah. Okay, okay. Dan and I never dated. We've been yeah. really close. Right, Dan? We just didn't. Exactly. Yeah, yeah we met. No, what happened, Dan? <laughs> well, he, we went on group dates, right? You, we did. Yeah, because... You're well, best friends with my wife, so we've been on group Yeah, days. see, that's the reason. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? I'm best friends with his <laughs> wife, so I couldn't go there. And besides, I was dating my husband at the time, so it just wasn't working. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, that time. Oh, in another life, Dan, but hang on. <laughs> anyway, so uh, back to Tinder. So back to Tinder. Ugh, oh, no God, more Tinder. we're still talking about this. Uh, over yet. No, I just, I'm so bored with my own story about Tinder. <laughs> um, but it is in the play. It does factor heavily in the play. And I did have a Tinder date come and see the show. That's got to be awkward. Two Tinder days coming to the show. He's had several Tinder uh, okay, days. Okay, but can I just tell you something? Three, soon what three. a way to so impress. Excuse me. What a way to impress somebody. Oh, um, you yeah, can come being, see me. Being like amazing at, in a show. You can come see me at work. You know, I'm in a play. Yeah. It's like, oh come well, on. But people know go see plays in the in in L. A. Really, so I feel I like. Do. And his character talks about Tinder in the play, so it's a double. It's very hilarious. appropriate. I am out to get more people to go to the theater in L. A. We've got Thank some you. great stuff. We, yeah, well, first of all, the Geffen is doing some terrific stuff. Mm -hmm. I go to all their stuff. The Geffen, you're doing a good job. This play in particular, and I love the name of it, Icebergs, particularly about what she's ranting about, the, you know, one of the head lead characters in the beginning mm -hmm. about uh, the, the walruses, right? Was it yeah, 35,000 yep. walruses. Right, that are, beach. yeah, and stranded. And that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm guessing that that's why she called it this for many, many reasons. So many of us are afloat on an iceberg, right? Mm -hmm. I guess. That's the idea, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really very astute of me, isn't it? That, mm. I, that I managed to, to mm. sort of weave that in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> But okay, so quickly, what else are you doing? You're doing this play. What's what's coming up for you after? Um, beyond Christmas at uh, in Northern California with my family, I don't have anything going on. Uh, something called pilot season is going to happen here, and it's anybody's guess what what that's going to be. Is that anxiety producing for you? Because I would think so. I've always wanted to act. I didn't. I think it's because if I were to do, you know, pilot season, I'd be a little anxious wondering, oh, what's going to happen? Or do you just get used to it? Well, you can you can worry about it or you can just like give over to the fact that it's going to happen and whatever's going to happen will happen. And that's I think that I've kind of arrived at the point where I'm like, it's so unpredictable and it's such a can I say shit on the air? You can say shit as much as you want. Go right ahead. Yeah. It's such a fucking shit show. There that, you go. <laughs> um, shit show crapshoot. Shit show crapshoot that you kind of, it's like, you just put it's, it not, out it's there. not worth, it's not worth worrying about. Like yeah. you can do what you can do and what happens happens. And it's like, and uh, you know your you stuff. Roll the dice. Yeah. First of all, you're very, you're a very distinguished actor. I mean, just rattle off a couple of things that you have done that are pretty amazing. You've worked with Jeff Goldblum. He's one of my favorites. He's I love excellent. that man. He's a terrific actor. And I've seen yeah. him in theater as well. He's a terrific theater actor. Yeah. Yeah. We got to do a play together. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, he, he has a piano in his dressing room and every time he does a show and he goes, he has a book, he has a pile of, of sheet music this high that he will just cycle through and play all these jazz standards. He has a standing like date. before he goes on stage to relax? Yeah, yeah. Or just, just whenever. Just Isn't backstage. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And nice. he'll, he'll sing and, and have people in and, and, you know, tinkle the keys as he likes to say. What a nice But he has a standing date at the rock, uh, what's that place on, 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 is it on Hyperion? Roxy? Period? What are you talking the, about? The, the rock, Rockwood, I didn't know that, but I would... Rockwell. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kurt. In Los Feliz. He, he does? does he okay, does that'd like be a fun a, thing a to thing. go do. Yeah, we should all go do that. Why don't we all go do that? Yeah. The, really, the Rockwell? Because I love to go and Rockwell see stuff like that. Forward. I did not know this, but I, I'm, I'm actually a very big fan of his. I think he's enormously talented. Yeah. And that'd be something fun to do. How about you? What are you doing, what are you doing next? Is there anything that you're you know, going to be working on? Or I don't know either. I mean, I have an audition tomorrow. Maybe I'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. but really, it's like that. Yeah. And what's you it get, for? It's for a, I'm actually not allowed to say. You know, I signed say, an NDA. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. But you guys are just cool about it. I mean, and you know, do you do, do you prefer doing theater or do you prefer doing television, film? I mean, what's... I took like a year and a half. I, I like all of it, but I took a year and a half break because I did four plays back to back. And I was just like, I can't do this. I can't have another opening night. I can't have another rehearsal period and make no money. And it's just like so uh, depressing. But um, 
doing this play after like a year and a half, I now I love theater. <laughs> and also, well, there was something... the, also the project you're behind is terrific. I mean, Icebergs is a great. It's that, but it's also like, you know, because it, so our first preview was election night. Mm. And there was something ever since then, it's just like something, all of us being in a room together, the audience, the people on stage, it's felt really important. And um, oh, especially on a night like that with some of the with some of the topics that yes. this, you know, that this play gets into. I yeah. mean, I can't even imagine being in and also because the, the play is so night. funny that just people being able to laugh right, and, and if let they were see, tense about what was going on. Yeah, was, they were like scream laughing that night. But but everybody sitting together and laughing has been really wonderful and has made me feel like that's just what I want to do right now in any form. Well, talk about the election. This is a great segue over into Dan. With Dan. The great voice. Dan, are you there, Dan? I'm here. He's like Thank sleeping. you for being there. No, he wouldn't fall asleep on me. He wouldn't dare. <laughs> Dan Lothian, former White House correspondent for CNN under uh, President Obama. I'm, I always love leading with that. In 20 years, I'll lead Such into a great him. title. No, you don't understand. We said, I mean, I say this every time because we started off together in the business and we were like sleeping on each other's floors. I mean, honest to God, pulling our first couch like out of a dumpster. It's really true stuff. But um, and now look at him. He was he was on Amazing. Air Force One for years following uh, around Obama. And I love to have him on just for a quick take about um, what do you think is going on politically, particularly with uh, some of the stories with Donald Trump and his son. I actually think that's been kind of nasty um, with, you know, with, the, with, with, with Barron, the with Barron. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of that's kind of rough. And um, also, I wanted to talk to you about ma the marathon. So um, I don't know. Do you want to take it away about what you think about what's uh, what the latest is about what's going on? Boy, there's you know there's just so much to talk about. Whether it's the transition going on, whether it's with his family, whether it's with his business, um, we're in uncharted territory. You know, this is not something that typically we are addressing at this juncture after an election. Um, it's typically talking about you know just the future, and people are usually, for the most part, pretty excited about it. And there's not a lot of uncertainty, and things are pretty much figured out at that point. And so it's, I think it's, you know, we really, we really don't know how to uh, react other than those who supported Donald Trump are still, for the most part, pretty excited. And those who did not have, still have a lot of questions. Some are coming around and saying, look, we have what we have, and, and now we have to figure out how it will go going forward. But, you know, with regards to his son, I think that that's an issue that, as journalists, we typically have taken a step back when it comes to reporting about issues concerning someone's child, um, unless a president or first lady decide to put their child out there and mention something about a birthday or they're out there for the pardoning of the turkey or whatever it might be. We typically <laughs> stay away from the kids, and I think that that's appropriate in this case as well. Oh, I agree, um, but I just thought I was shocked when um, when Rosie O'Donnell came out and said anything about about his child, regardless of, of um, what may or may not be true. It just was absolutely not right. her, her. Of course, her. they have this ongoing feud <laughs> between the two of them. But they can so fight can all they want. That spills out into she the also kids. has so, a, you know, Everyone's children. looking to go for the next low blow, it seems. But, um, yeah, I, th I think that, that you should be hands off when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that you hear about. Uh, certainly, I mean, I'm not putting her in the journalism category, but as journalists, there are a lot of things that you hear about when it comes to the kids of whether it's the president or top officials in government, that has absolutely nothing to do with their job, and you hear them as rumors, or you know about them as fact, and you stay away from them. And that's God, is kind he of not distinguished? Rule, and I think it's appropriate in this case as well. You could tell me anything with that voice. <laughs> I mean, right? I, I mean, you're like, just so know. distinguished, Dan, and <laughs> just so on point, and you're always managed to go on both sides and never really piss anybody off. That's why you're such a terrific journalist, I have to say. But this... this <laughs> I try. <laughs> no, thank you very much. You should see us, like, at midnight, you know, when we're really talking stuff, when, when nobody's listening. It's like, oh, boy. <laughs> right? <laughs> the, the gloves come off? Oh, yeah, the gloves come off. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this play that we were talking about, Icebergs, is actually, um, it was terrific. I don't know if it's going to be traveling or if it's going to end up back east. What are the plans for it you know it's because you would enjoy it a lot uh, dan i know you would your family it's a world premiere yeah. so you, you kind of don't know where it's going to go elena would like it to go to new york and to go around i could see that but it touches on all kinds How of about boston? boston yeah boston he's up he's up in boston, in boston? dc chicago yeah, yeah. why not yeah, yeah i know or next time you come out here i don't know how long what's the run here we're running till December 18th. Until December 18th. Yeah. Okay. But it's very topical about what's going on politically, about what's going on socially, um, about what's going on environmentally. And that's why I thought it would be fun to sort of have you in and just, 
you know, just your take about what's going to be happening with the transition even over the next uh, month or two. Have you been hearing anything behind the scenes? Yeah, I, I, again, we, we heard today about his economic team coming together. Also, it was announced today that uh, uh, and it, well, I guess there'll be some sort of a press conference on the 15th of December where Donald Trump is expected to uh, publicly uh, tell the nation that he is essentially divorcing himself from his business. And we don't know how that will look, but that has been the conversation because – you know, there is no law that specifically spells out that a president or vice president cannot have ongoing business interests. I think from a from a um, sort of visual standpoint, um, you need to you need to let people know that there won't be a conflict. But there, the law does not require it. But there's been a lot of uh, chatter about that in recent days, and I think everyone agrees that if this continues, it will be a a, a big distraction from what he is, has been elected to do. Um, people didn't elect him to continue running his business. People elected him to solve problems. And so I think he realizes that, or at least certainly the people around him have realized it. And so it appears that we will soon be hearing how that will take place. Uh, I think there was a tweet where he pointed out that he will be, um, that they're putting together the legal structure now as to how that will look. And so we should be hearing about that uh, in the next uh, weeks or so. And so I think that's important because um, there, there are a lot of issues that the Trump organization is currently dealing with, with gov foreign governments. And it just seems a little messy that you're going to be having a conversation with a particular world leader about ISIS or something else. And then all of a sudden you're trying when, to put your hotel there. Right. Yeah, you, you have a hotel there, and both sides know that, that there's this issue that has to do with private business. It has to come up. I can't yeah, see how it wouldn't come up, what, right? What about his and kids? So a lot of people say his kids shouldn't even be running it, that it should all be put into a blind trust. What are, yeah, your, what are your thoughts you know, on that stuff, look, guys? I think that you have to, if your kids have been part of your organization, it's really hard to strip the entire family out of it, especially when it's a company that really relies heavily on the brand, on the Trump name. And so I think you could be, you know, it could present some problems. And so I, I personally don't have a problem with his kids being involved in the business. What I do have a problem with is his kids being involved in the business and his kids also being involved in the transition and potentially uh, advising. No, it's like even a monarchy. They don't have an official yeah. role, but advising. Yeah. And that's where the waters get a little muddy. But I think, you know, you have a business. Business has to run. I think you structure it in such a way that, that the lines are not blurred. And, um, you know, you can't, it won't be clear. Clean. It won't be 100% clean, but you at least have to make an effort to make it as clean as possible. Lucas, what were you going to say? No, I think, I, I mean, I, having it be in the hands of the family is one thing, but then when your family is also being part, becoming of the whole a, right. part team. of your transition team, then it kind of defeats the purpose of separating those two things. I wonder if they thought about all this, no, honestly. He I think he just sort of ran. He didn't I want think, to win. <laughs> I think he did want to win. I'm you not don't. sure he thought he could take it all the way. I have to tell you... I've said this from the beginning. When he first announced, I said, that guy's going to get it. He's going to win, not just the nomination. He's taking it all the way. And everybody's like, no, never. I said, you'll see. And then those of us who are from New York, we kind of get his, I, I just got it. But mm. I don't think he thought this far through. Do you? Like, Gosh, what am I going to do with the businesses? No, right? of course yeah, not. Yeah, I don't think. I personally don't think he did. I think Donald Trump, uh, and from what I know about him, I think he likes to fight. He likes to win. He likes to prove that he can win. And, um, you know, then all of a sudden it's like, wow, he was winning and he could really take it all the way. And, uh, you know, his supporters certainly uh, were coming out in droves and, and pushing him and motivating uh, his candidacy. And then he wins. And now the question is, what happens next? And I think that, you know, if, if he really wants to, this is a serious endeavor. This is not just a game show. This is not just a, a business that you're building to make a little bit of money. This, these are people who went out, each vote means so much, right, that someone came out and they put their future in your hands. And it's a, it's a heady place to be in. And I think that by him coming out, and as I pointed out earlier, and saying he's going to step away from his business, it's an admission that he's taken this seriously. And we have to take him at his word. And, and then, you know, look, I, I think that Far be it from me to sit here and predict how things will turn out. Predict. Come What's on. Important That's what we're here for. We... I want your opinion. Huh? I want your opinion. Predict. Well, Come I, on. Don't, I don't know how it's going to turn out. But what I hope is, is that it will be good. <laughs> I mean, you can only hope the best 
that no matter the rhetoric that we've heard, and certainly I think that Trump needs to come out and in a very powerful way sort of, you know, squash a lot of the rhetoric that, we, that we've been hearing out there. Um, it's, it's, I don't believe that that's how he is personally, but I do believe that the rhetoric of the campaign has awakened a lot of things that before people did not be, feel comfortable sharing in public. It, it's not as if it just started. It's always been there, but people did not want to express some of those things in public, and now they feel very comfortable to do that. I think he needs to put a stop to that, and it's more than just saying on 60 Minutes, quote, cut it out. No, he or said, stop it he said whatever it is. stop, and I'm thinking, seriously? Not right. That's I mean, it? it needs to be as forceful as he has come out about other less important issues. Like, and so, like Hamilton. <laughs> Yeah. What did you guys? Okay. What did you guys think about that? It's not even worth talking about, honestly. Because he was. I think he was distracting us from the real issue of that day, which is that he settled a twenty-five million dollar lawsuit for um, for Trump University. Yeah. Yeah. For screwing over for screwing over the American people. That's what Trump can do. I mean, I always. That's why when you say when you say we have to take him at his word, I'm like, do we? Do we? Okay, what but is but his word? I have to say, you know? I don't think any of them. Well, why, well what's the opposite? Words, Let's not take him at his word and be miserable every day. No, you're right. right? You're, you're well, absolutely right you about know. that. Yeah. But I'm also like, his word, it changes all the time. And he's, I, I don't I know. I think we just had to be really on guard. I think that, you That's know. That's the point. We, well, I agree. I think, par, I think part of it, we, we kind of have to wait and see what happens. But I think we have to right. be prepared for him we have to also take him at his word for everything that he said up until this point, and which I think like is said. cause for concern when it comes to civil rights issues, when it comes to women's rights, when it comes to all, you know, envir- the, the, like the environment. Like he's p- put rights. targets on a lot of things, gay rights, Muslims, Muslims, immigrants in general. I mean, like there are a lot of things that he's said, I think, in order to win the popularity yeah. contest that right. like his part of his appeal i think was that he wasn't playing by the rules and that he was saying whatever was on the top of his mind and people respected that because it felt like it wasn't part of the political jargon but i think now he actually is president it's like we have to kind of see if he how much he's going to play by the rules how much is he going to still become this like say kind of like f you to the system which is kind of the attitude that got him there right and notice he's backing I, well, down I, on well, a lot here, of stuff the though there are, I, I like to point this out he is but he's when, also putting a lot of people i've covered so many different campaigns over the years since the 90 early 90s and every single time there is the what people say in the campaign which most of it's a lie mm-hmm. and what people say when they win and that's on and all so sides I, I, when I'm, I'm talking about taking my word now as as a president Look, President Obama promised a lot of things to Hispanics when he was running and didn't deliver at all right. uh, during the first administration and then started trying to address some of those things later on. There are a lot of things that people say in order to get votes. And I don't, I'm not saying it's right. I think it's wrong. Every politician does it. And so, frankly, I personally never believe in a single thing that they say out there. You buy it what you want to buy into and whatever it is, but they say things to get votes. Now the question is, what, what is he going to say and what is he going to do as president? And in the, er- the early indications are a lot of the things that he did say that were important to him, he's now backing away from. I think some of his supporters are going to be very upset. You know, when he's being a little wishy-washy now on whether he really wants to build the wall or will it be a fence, you know, or... How can anyone whether, ever, Wait a minute. How can anyone ever believe that he was going to build a wall and then you're going to pay for it, Mexico? I mean, I'm sitting there going, come on, does but anybody really believe that? that he said, or, believe you know, it. lock her up, which was a big rallying cry right. for Trump, and now it's now like, well, that's so something... Mad or that. whether it's get rid of all of, uh, of Obamacare... Well, I don't know. Pre-existing conditions is important, and, right. and insuring yeah. 20-some-year-olds is important as well. So the fact is that that right there is evidence that he did a lot of things to get supporters, and now he's backing away from those things. So I'm going to take him at his word now as president. And if it's something that is, is against you know, sort of civil rights and some of these other things, I think people need to rise up and, and to protest those kinds of things. But I think we may be pleasantly surprised at some things that he does, um, I'm a little surprised, but he set is. the bar the so low. <laughs> That's a great point. Did you did you hear what Lucas said? He goes pleasantly surprised because the bar was set so low. I mean, for the- I mean, it's like we're surprised that he's not, you know, uh, like deporting Muslims. It's like I don't know. Yeah, I. I, I know. How could he have even? I mean, honestly, the fact that anyone believed that he would have even done that. I the knew, thing is that people, I think, he's, he's did a believe. Race, he's a racist. I think people no did believe. I don't think and he I think is. People, I don't think. What so. about the Central Park Five? Well, 
I don't know. Dan, thoughts? Seems I don't know about that. Thing. You know what I think? Here's what I think about Trump, because we only have a few minutes left. I think sometimes he's a New Yorker, and he's very brash, mm-hmm. and he's a yeah. little, he's arrogant. And we all know how a lot of New Yorkers can be. They just say whatever's on their mind. Yeah, it's the great when it's on his TV show. Yeah, but you know what? But that's why <laughs> I, I agree with Dan. And again, I brought him on because he's a guy who followed around Obama. I mean, you know, he's and he's got such great perspective. And I and also tying into this play about all kinds of political issues and environmental issues. It's just interesting to see. We got to wait. And I agree. Just stand behind him a little bit or at least just wait. And what you said, be a little vigilant. You won't. You're saying I will no not way. Stand behind I, him. I think there's a no difference way. between standing behind him, which to me says we're giving hold him, him accountable. your support. I mean, I, I think I think we do have to hold him accountable. Yeah, I and I think that. that we have to be very uh, watch watch what happens with a very close eye, because right. I think that I he's I, yeah, I think he, like his that appointments in the White House. I think it's the same thing with President Obama. You know, I think yeah. there should have been a lot more pressure from Latino groups and, and some others who, who did not, um, you know, things that he had set out on the campaign trail that never materialized for whatever reason. I mean, the administration will say, well, we had the, you know, we had the financial crisis and, we're, and we had to focus on that and drop a lot of things. And that's, there's, that's a valid argument. But, do you think- but I think it's always important that we keep politicians' feet to the fire. Agreed. And, That's a good way uh, to put it, too. No but do you think that this is a slightly different case because a lot of the things that he has proposed actually makes it unsafe for certain people in this country? And that it actually repeal, would, if it were to move forward, would repeal certain I don't think that can happen. Uh, if that I happens, don't, I, don't I think we would. That but that's happen. maybe not. But he's suggesting. But, but that's what he's suggested, and I think that there he, it has created a an environment where we feel like that could be possible, and where some people sure. are vocally sure. in favor of that, which I think is different than different saying, than Obama. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, trying to help the Hispanic help popu- population and not, and then failing. not helping, as opposed to saying, you know, if you have I'm rights gonna take now, away. we're gonna take it away, <laughs> and we actually may make it create a, an environment that encourages more bullying, encourages violence. You know, guys, no, you're, you're, look, you're correct. We've never like 30 seen seconds. anything like this. <laughs> you know, and even a president tweeting and saying the kinds of things that he randomly says, we've never seen this. So yeah. we yeah. have to buckle our seatbelts and hang on for the ride. I'm going to tweet him back at three in the morning. Hey, I'm going to tweet somebody, him back at three in the morning and see if he answers me. It's like, look, Donald. Somebody take his Twitter away. I mean, honestly. Hey, I think, I, I think, uh, I think I'm he sure is. That's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, who I knows? So. He's pissed yeah. off or something. God knows what he's going to say. And then in some other country. But I just thought it was kind of interesting because, even, you know, Icebergs brings up so much. And I just thought tying in a little little bit with what's really going on. Yeah, politically. That's great. Definitely. Thank you. You guys Thanks. were so amazing. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Dan, Thanks for we never us. got yep. to talk about Thanks, the, the Boston Marathon, the Boston marathon that you ran because. Run, run, run. Oh, my train, God. Lucas train, train, is about to run a marathon. Where's your time, Dan? Oh, no. I have to have you back because I'm going to walk. I don't run. I'm going to walk the L.A. Marathon. I'll be the, there. Oh, my God. He's running. No, yeah. No, no, no. I tra- oh, my God. I need more time because I um, did it last week for the first time you know walked with the yeah. walkers yeah i'm telling you i would I love walk. to do that because i don't run you're either. doing it with me i'm okay, okay i was last like behind 85 year olds <laughs> it doesn't left. matter bullshit i'm gonna it's gonna take me 14 hours i won't even have anything to, to walk across but i'm gonna do it <laughs> do it i to me uh, like what blew me away was that there was so much uh like positive like people come out to watch and support and it's like insane i'm like why are you you don't like, understand why are you here oh my like, god we have to talk about the signs and stuff it's amazing i am it's the really... fastest walker people call me like deborah gump because they see me everywhere all oh, you around do walk. i walked with you one time you I can know. walk fast. i walk so fast That's how could thing. i have been behind i'm telling you dan run than walk with you I, this is true <laughs> i was behind the 85 year olds and 90 year olds running <laughs> how do how, then how do i end up behind all 90 year old men i mean i was so ashamed and embarrassed when i showed up like last at the that the it's with the road runners that i'm doing it with right. and i was like dead last on saturday morning i was showed up at 6 30 i'm a little late to the party here and i'm like oh man i'm really gonna do this and everybody's there they're having their cliff bars and just talking and i'm thinking <laughs> how did you get ahead of me but so anyway, I'm gonna. I have to have you back on because I need some like tips with training and stuff like that. Okay. Um, yeah. Also, no. one more thing. Next week we're going to be having on um, Alex Ribble from um, the Good News Foundation. He's amazing. He's doing such incredible, incredible work. So he's going to come on and be talking about some things that he's working on and the celebrities in town are working on because you know it's it's the holiday. So let's try and do something positive for people, right? Yeah. All right, you guys, thanks for being here. Everybody Thank go you. see Icebergs, please, over at the Geffen Playhouse here in Los Angeles. Thanks for being with us. Another fun edition of What's Up with Cobalt and Friends. See you next week. Bye-bye.